Welcome to part two, quantum computing and information. Quick introduction to pique your curiosity. In the grand scheme of things in the field of quantum chemistry, electron spin is not emphasized since spin up versus spin down from intrinsic angular momentum create quite small energy differences compared to those from orbital angular momentum or Coulomb energy based on the relative position and momentum of the electrons with respect to each other and the protons in the nuclei the latter of which is much more relevant to molecular bonding and multi-atom systems, which obviously is the focus of chemistry in general. Electron spin is much more pertinent to the fields of atomic physics and spectroscopy, and after getting a comprehensive intuition of what quantum spin is from part one, we are ready to examine how this idea explains why quantum computing is theoretically more effective than classical computing. So what is a quantum computer? Classical computers use digital binary logic, meaning each transistor can only be in the zero or one state, which represents a single bit of information. Quantum computers, on the other hand, use qubits, which is just an arbitrary point on the block sphere. Notice how qubits on the block sphere can be in a continuum of states along any direction or orientation, not just in the binary zero spin down or one spin up state. Indeed, for a qubit, with measurement along a particular direction, quantization to the spin down or spin up state does happen, supposedly erasing the extra information from the continuum of states. But with repeated measurements by reproducing the same probabilistic experiment and looking at the resultant data, we can deduce the 3 by 2 joint probability matrix by looking at the statistics, as will be discussed next. Brief interlude on probability and statistics. The details of this could be another separate video in itself, but here's a brief interlude on the relevant probability and statistics. Here's the intuition. Let's say we have a Schrodinger's cat in a box, and it's in a superposition state of 30% dead and 70% alive, which we don't know yet, of course, and we want to measure this superposition state and deduce what it is. Uh, if we open the box, the cat will be dead 30% of the time and alive 70% of the time. If we open the box just one time, we don't really get much information. But what if we repeat the experiment a multitude of times? We should get about 30% of the experiments having a dead cat and 70% of the experiments with a living cat, and this way we can guess what state the cat was originally in before we opened the box. It is actually physically supposedly easy to repeat these quantum experiments multiple times in all three cardinal measurement directions, just take a bunch of identical electrons and simultaneously subjugate them all to the same ambient external environmental conditions and electromagnetic fields, as we will see later when we get more in depth with how MRI works. This is a key idea to remember moving forward. In more mathematical detail using probability and statistics next, it can be shown that the inadmissible maximum likelihood estimator of a binary Bernoulli distribution is basically just the mean, specifically defined as the number of successful Bernoulli trials divided by the total number of Bernoulli trials. Intuitively, this would make sense because the peak value, which corresponds to the maximum likelihood or log likelihood of a Bernoulli binomial distribution should be about the mean. This maximum likelihood estimator is asymptotically correct and converges to the true parameters of the binary distribution, which can be shown using the law of large numbers and the central limit theorem. Alternatively, this probabilistic or statistical scenario can equivalently be viewed as how the empirical distribution of a Bernoulli binary distribution will approach the true distribution by Sanov's maximal information projection theorem, since the kullback liebler divergence is minimized when the empirical distribution ends up being the true distribution itself, since we have no large deviation theory information constraints. In the real world, we will never get to an infinite number of samples n for the law of large numbers and central limit theorem to truly hold, but that is okay. The Bayesian theorem bound, whose proof could yet be another entire video series on its own, says that the distribution of our sample mean will never deviate from a standard normal distribution more than an upper bound that is proportional to 1 over square root n, meaning the standard normal distribution remains a good approximation even when n is not infinity, which shows that the central limit theorem holds even for just large n that isn't infinite. Furthermore, the variance of the standard normal distribution for the sample mean shrinks proportional to 1 over n, meaning that the law of large numbers also holds even for just large n that isn't infinite. All of the previous explanations are just fancy mathematical explanations of the same intuitive concept from statistics. If we want to check if we have a fair coin or not, and even estimate how unfair it might be, flip it a bunch of times and see how many heads and tails we get. If we want to know just how dead or alive the cat actually is, just repeat the probabilistic experiment of opening the Schrodinger cat box over and over again, and see a tally up how many cats were dead and how many were alive. This goes to show that using sample mean values, we can make reasonable measurements for the 3 by 2 joint or conditional probability matrix, which gives us the specific orientation of our qubit on the block sphere if we repeat the identical experiment enough times for large enough n, and the larger the n, the more accurate our results should be. This illustrates the importance of the law of large numbers when we take measurements of spin.
So now that we know what a qubit is and how to measure its state, how is a quantum computer theoretically supposedly potentially superior to a classical computer? The most immediately obvious but not the most useful answer is density of information storage, which is an idea from information theory. So what exactly is information? Here is an example to illustrate. In 1978, famous world chess champion Karpov was brought blueberry yogurt during the middle of the world chess championship match. People suspected cheating and that key information was contained in the arrival of the yogurt possibly to signal to offer a draw. Karpov did indeed offer a draw a few moves later, but nobody really knows what happened since many claim this was a prank. But here's the key idea. The blueberry yogurt contained information. Imagine what types of messages we could secretly send to the world chess champion if we had the option to send strawberry yogurt, peach yogurt, vanilla yogurt, or any other flavor we wanted. This is the key fundamental idea behind information theory. A classical binary logic bit can only store the information for the answer to a single yes-no question, such as, does Bob have any apples? It can uniquely represent two different states in total. This corresponds to just two different possible flavors of yogurt. A qubit quantum bit, on the other hand, can store the answer to a more complicated question, such as, specifically, how many apples does Bob have? which corresponds to how it is possible to uniquely represent a continuum of different states in total, the space of which is much larger than just two states from the classical bit. This corresponds to a range of possible flavors of yogurt, not just two. Intuitively, this is why a qubit is more powerful than a classical binary bit. To answer the same question of how many apples does Bob have to the same degree of accuracy with the same amount of information in response using only classical bits, we would have to use more than one classical bit as illustrated here. If we can only ask yes-no questions, we can only ask questions such as, does Bob have more than a dozen apples? Or, does Bob have any apples at all? And this way we can slowly successively narrow our search space down to pinpoint just how many apples Bob actually has, demonstrating the idea of binary informational entropy. That being said, storing information is different from reading out the previously stored information. Let's say if Bob has too many apples, we're going to have to tax him because many countries utilize a progressive tax system. How do we find out if Bob has too many apples from the government's annals records stored on qubits? Unfortunately, to actually read out from a qubit this previously stored information to tax Bob accordingly, we're going to have to maintain multiple copies of the records of on qubits storing the exact same information due to the law of large numbers concept as previously discussed. That is okay though, a qubit is usually just a single proton or electron spin, and the smallest transistors, which of course operate using electric current flowing electrons, are still significantly larger than a single proton or electron qubit. Transistors are classical devices and they cannot ever become too small for quantum effects to interfere with how they operate. Thus, this demonstrates how qubits can comparatively beat classical transistor bits for just pure information storage purposes. Luckily nowadays, with all the available cloud storage, information storage capacity density, as previously discussed, doesn't seem to be a problem pertinent to our society. Data scientists are acquiring and storing more data than our computational power can actually handle processing. So the real problem relevant to modern technology is how to do computations more quickly and efficiently, which is the real reason why quantum computing can theoretically do better than classical computing. So how can a quantum computer perform computations faster than a classical computer? The answer lies in parallel processing. What is parallel processing? Let's say we are trying to guess someone's four-digit bank pin. There are 10 to the fourth possible combinations of bank pins, really permutations since order matters. The only way to go about this is to brute force check every single pin combination until we happen to stumble across the right one. A classical computer would only be able to check one combination at a time, and will have to wait quite long for the computer to successively go through each and every single subsequent pin combination in order. A quantum computer, on the other hand, could simultaneously check all 10 to the 4th possible bank pins together at once in parallel, giving us the correct answer in much less time. Some computations may take so extraordinarily long to complete that at current classical computing speeds, we may have to wait longer than a human lifespan, which is not desirable. So how is a quantum computer able to do parallel processing so much better than the classical computer? In a nutshell, I think the fundamental big picture of this is best illustrated using Schrodinger's cat. In a classical computation sequence on a classical logic gate binary bit transistor, the cat is quantized to either being dead or alive. Let's say we perform some series of logical operations on the classical transistor. Before we can move on to the next successive logical operation in the sequence, the cat needs to be fixed or quantized to either the dead state or the alive state. This fundamentally throws away or erases information during our computational process, as we saw in the previous example discussion with the question of specifically how many apples does Bob have. For comparison, in a quantum computer on the other hand, the cat can remain in a superposition of being both dead and alive at the same time simultaneously. 
any qubit logical operations will operate on both the dead state and the alive state together and at the same time without throwing away any information, allowing parallel processing to happen. That is why the classical computer checks each of the 10 to the 4th bank pins sequentially just one at a time, one after the other, while the quantum computer has the capability of checking all 10 to the 4th bank pins together all at once simultaneously. Doesn't measuring a qubit quantize the binary state throwing out valuable information like the classical logic gate? Though measurement of the qubit does indeed end up quantizing its state to either the spin down or spin up state, analogously throwing away information just like how the classical transistor must fix itself to a binary state before moving on with the series of logical operations, we reserve all measurements for when all the final computations are complete so we don't disturb our computational procedure or throw out any important information during the computational process. This is because we don't actually care about the, re the results of any of the intermediate steps in computation since we only care about the final result of the computation, so there is no need to interfere during the process. Therefore, as long as we hold off on any measurement until the end of the entire quantum computational procedure, we can perform as much parallel computation on a superposition of states as we want, and we never actually collapse the wave function to any particular quantized state during the process until the very end when it is all finally over. When the computational procedure is completely finished, we take measurements on the entire population of hopefully identical qubits and utilize the law of large numbers to deduce the final quantum state, which will be the final output of all our computational work. To get more into the nitty-gritty details of classical versus quantum computation, all of classical computing at its fundamental level is based off of logic gates. There are a bunch of basic standard logic gates or transistors corresponding to AND, OR, IF, NOT, exclusive or and if and only if operations, which can be seen in the true-false tables shown. And it can be proven that with just two allowed types of these logical operations and chaining or cascading them together, we can create a Turing-complete universal logic system. So to generalize, any generalized logic gate is a black box that takes in a bunch of input data and eventually spits out true or false accordingly. That means no matter how much data we have to begin with, at the fundamental level of classical computation, no matter how we design or chain our logic gate operators, we can only process our data one at a time using binary logic yes-no questions, and each intermediate step in the overall computation scheme will be based off of yes-no results. If we want parallel computation using only classical technology, we need to have multiple logical gates operating simultaneously at the same time to process data more efficiently, and that will eventually lead to physical limitations since we can only have so many logic gates going off together at once on our microchip processor. However, on the other hand, quantum computation is not limited to just yes-no questions. While the output space of a single generalized classical logic gate is only true-false, the output space of a single quantum operation can be in the continuum of states, and thus quantum operations preserve all information and do not throw out anything at all, until the final measurement, of course, much unlike classical operations. That means just one quantum gate operation can do the computational work of many, many classical gates. Comparing a classical gate operation versus a quantum gate operation is like trying to dig your own grave or dig a hole to China, where they have superior quantum technology, with a plastic spoon or shovel versus one of those heavy-duty excavator machines. Both tools can perform the same function, but one is way more efficient and effective than the other. In the grand scheme of things, a single lone classical bit or qubit on its own it by itself cannot represent the data output of computational work, so this is not a good comparison. But when chained together with their buddies, they can accomplish great tasks. With enough identical qubits working together, you can start taking accurate measurements using the law of large numbers, and with enough classical logic gates, you can run more complicated algorithms. If you have a team of construction workers with plastic spoons versus another squad with a similar number of employees of equally trained construction workers with giant, very heavy-duty excavator machines, I would put money on the latter reaching China before the first team even finishes digging their own graves with the plastic spoons. And likewise, a group of qubits working together can accomplish much more than the equivalent comparable number of classical bits occupying a similar amount of space. We will see the mechanics of just how and why in the next example. Let's say we want to take the number of apples Bob has this year as input data and calculate or figure out what to do with his taxes. Let's say we can only perform one operation at a time, whether it be a classical or quantum one. Notice how this is very similar to cart or tree-based regression or classification in statistical machine learning, where we have four classification taxation class regions in one dimension, which represents the number of apples Bob has. Notice how this is also very similar to Huffman or Shannon binary coding from information theory as well. Notice how in the classical computation scheme, the best case scenario is we perform only one operation, 
And the worst case scenario is we go through the entire depth of the binary tree and perform three operations. In the second classical computation scheme, we always need to perform two operations no matter what. So it will always require at least one or more classical operations, one after another in succession, to figure out Bob's taxes while using classical methodology. On the other hand, in the quantum computation scheme, we always only need one operation. Excluding the final readout part for a moment, the quantum scheme gets the computational part of the job done in one go all at once. So let's think about this for a second. In the grand scheme of things, figuring out Bob's taxes is quite a simple problem, and no matter what methodology we use, it only requires a handful of operations in total. Let's say that after we figure out what to do with Bob's taxes, we want to calculate Bob's corresponding credit score, which is based on a combination of factors including his taxes. That would mean Bob's tax calculation is an intermediate step or intermediate result or subroutine in the overall credit score computation, and we need the results of Bob's tax calculation before we can move on to the next and proceed with the succeeding credit score computation. Let's say we ultimately only care about Bob's credit score, and we don't actually care about Bob's taxes. For the quantum computation scheme, we won't even need to measure or collapse the wave function of the intermediate result of the subroutine tax computation, and we can directly move on to the credit score computation using the unread, unmeasured information from the superposition state, labeled in the diagram, that is the intermediate result of the tax computation subroutine. Though it costs nothing to read the output information from classical computation, the theoretical costs of reading the final output information from quantum computation are actually quite negligible. One simply measures the total magnetic field vector to observe the total net magnetization vector of the entire population of spin domains in the material, which will be discussed in more depth in the section on the physics of MRI. Even if there is some cost in readout of the final output information from quantum computation, no matter how many cascaded or nested subroutines within sub routines we have in our computational algorithm, since we make measurements only at the very end of the entire computational procedure, this ends up being just a single one-time cost and does not scale with algorithm complexity and how many subroutines we have. Meanwhile, on the other hand, even though there is no classical readout cost, it is pretty safe to say that each quantum subroutine ends up beating out any equivalently functioning classical subroutine, which makes up for any one-time costs, and the more cascaded or nested subroutines within subroutines we have, the farther behind in terms of computational speed the classical computer falls or lags behind than the quantum computer. Thus, quantum computers can outperform classical computers for parallel algorithms that are complicated, long, drawn out, and multi-step. And thus, this goes to show how because quantum computers work in a superposition of states instead of binary states, quantum computers can beat classical computers not just in terms of the obvious case of information storage density, but also in actual computational practice, which is basically just information manipulation. There is a lot of hype nowadays about quantum computing and how it can shape our future technologies. Unfortunately, it sounds like we still have a long way to go before any groundbreaking quantum computing experiments will happen. One of the leading lecturers at the 2017 Quantum Information Processing Convention in Seattle mentioned that as much as physicists and mathematicians like to theorize about quantum computing, it is up to the engineers to come up with practical working technologies to put these theoretical results into practice. And it sounds like the technological side still has a long way to go. A particular example issue scientists are struggling with is, and in practice, it is quite challenging to accurately to almost exact measurements read the output information's final net magnetization vector, because it is difficult to eliminate eliminate all thermal and quantum noise in the system, let alone the already existing challenge of dealing with the law of large numbers which includes the challenge of creating many independent and identically distributed IID spin experiments, which is difficult in reality because some spins affect other spins, as can be seen with the icing model of ferromagnetism which will be discussed later. And this could be the subject of another video on cryptography, but if we actually wanted to put Shor's algorithm into practice and force everyone to go into post-quantum cryptography, we really will need extremely accurate instruments and measurement equipment. Classical integer factorization algorithms already work quite well for large numbers, so the quantum computer using Shor's algorithm, which could be an entire video, needs to use extremely accurate measurements to be even able to remotely compete. And it sounds like the best somewhat recent quantum computers were only like able to feasibly factor 15 into 5 and 3, which is not too impressive. So to quickly recap, in a bare-bones nutshell explanation, quantum computing relies on a computational procedure involving intermediate steps containing a superposition of states where Schrodinger's cat can be both dead and alive at the same time simultaneously. 
whereas classical computing forces Schrodinger's cat to be quantized to be either dead or alive at each and every intermediate step along the way, which throws away valuable information, allowing quantum computing using spin qubits with a continuum of states to be superior to classical computing using binary bits in terms of rapid and efficient parallel computation, at least theoretically. Thus, this concludes Part 2, Quantum Computing and Information.